In the last paragraph of the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels call for a forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. But could there be an alternative to that, a peaceful, non-violent approach to topple the establishment? Well, if you're a communist in post-war Japan, that might just be the only way. I'm your host David, and this week we're going to look at the role of communism in post-war Japan and the impact the superpowers had on that role. This is The Cold War. Peaceful, nonviolent revolution can be hard work and can really make a person hungry. If you're looking for a snack to share with your comrades, you need to subscribe to the sponsor of this video, Boxu. Boxu is a monthly snack box subscription service that delivers original assortments of premium Japanese snacks and tea pairings right to your door. Every month, you'll receive a box with a different theme. The snacks will always be different, so it becomes a new gourmet journey through Japan every month. This month's box celebrates the Otsukimi Moon Festival, which has been celebrated since the Heian period, with people gathering to honor the beauty of the harvest moon. We really enjoyed the black strawberries, chocolatey fruitiness, and Toritama Baumkuchen Matcha Cake. The box is shipped straight from Japan and comes straight to you. Order now using the link in the description and use our code COLDWAR10 to get 10% off the subscription to Authentic Japanese Snack Box from Boxu. Take advantage of this limited time offer. Okay, now before we can speak about communism and the Japanese Communist Party in post-war Japan, we have to talk a little bit about its origins and its pre-war position. Marxist thought was first introduced to Japan at the turn of the 19th century through various intellectual circles, but it wasn't until 1922 that the Japanese Communist Party was founded in Tokyo with its early leadership coming from anarcho-syndicalist and Christian socialist movements. One of the founders was Sanzo Nosaka, a celebrity among Japanese communists at that time. Nosaka would come to play a leading role for the party after the war. But how were the communists viewed in larger society? Well, the party was not welcomed in the increasingly militarized Japan and was outlawed in 1925 through the Peace Preservation Law. Its members were subjected to repression and persecution by the Special Higher Police, or as it was more commonly called, the Thought Police. Registered members, and even people who were suspected of being communist sympathizers, were imprisoned, with many of them remaining behind bars until the end of the Pacific War in 1945, waiting for the party's resurgence. After Japan's formal surrender on September 2, 1945, the American General Douglas MacArthur, acting as the Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers, or PESCAP for short, immediately launched sweeping political, economic, and social reforms in Japan. These reforms would greatly benefit the Japanese communists, who were still treated with hostility by the Japanese government in the early weeks of the American occupation. The communists were quick to celebrate the country's defeat, and even since mid-August, after the emperor publicly announced the surrender, some of the communists boasted that their time had finally come. Yet, for a full month after the unconditional surrender, the Japanese government didn't relax its wartime censorship and continued to arrest those who were suspected of being sympathetic to the communist cause. All that would change on the 4th of October, when an SCAP directive, known as the Japanese Bill of Rights, ordered the release of all political prisoners. The purpose of this directive, which granted unprecedented freedom of thought and political action in Japan, was to remove obstacles that would hinder the democratization of the islands in the way the United States wanted. At the same time, however, it set free radical revolutionary elements and granted for the first time in Japan's history legal status to the Communist Party. Six days later, a group of communists that had been imprisoned for almost two decades was released. They would immediately assume political activities, trying to pick up where they had left off. Among them were Tokuda Kyuichi and Shiga Yoshio, who formed part of the leadership of the party. Ten days following their release, they circulated the first post-war issue of the communist newspaper, Akahara, or Red Flag. The communists distributed almost 10,000 copies of this 20-page pamphlet that included an appeal to the people. I would like to think that Korg would be impressed by those numbers. 
In the pamphlet, they expressed gratitude and support for the peace policy of the Allied powers, as well as a pledge to overthrow the Emperor system in order to establish a people's democracy, promises to eliminate militarism and pass general reforms regarding labor unions, laws, and land redistribution, and finally an attack towards the pseudo-socialists, also known as the Socialist Party. This attack was based on the grounds that the Socialist Party had cooperated and supported the Emperor's system. Yet paradoxically, it went against another party wish, which was the formation of a united front against more conservative parties. This paradox of wanting an alliance, but also condemning the same elements that were seeking cooperation with, would consistently plague the Japanese Communist Party through the entire post-war era. Less than two months after the Bill of Rights, the Communist Party of Japan, with over 1,000 registered members, held its fourth national congress, its first in 19 years. By January of the following year, the JPC, that's the Japanese Communist Party, had formed a program or a strategy that it would follow until 1950. The ultimate goal of the party was similar to that of other communist parties around the world, but what was different in Japan's case was the approach. Three major points shaped the way the Japanese Communist Party would operate in the near future. The first was the form of the Japanese Revolution and its immediate goals. The second was the tactics that would be used in regards to the revolution, and finally, the party's stance towards the American occupation. The last question is perhaps the easiest to address, and had been answered from the very outset when the released communists welcomed the American troops as liberators and pledged their full support. Nosaka, who had returned from China to assume party leadership, reiterated this position during the Fifth Party Congress in February. To attack ESCAP and the rest of the Allied powers that had literally liberated them would be political suicide, especially since the Americans, for the time at least, weren't bothering them and were instead focused on the demilitarization and democratization of Japan. Both of these tasks were part of the political agenda of the Communist Party, and thus it was in their interest to support the occupiers. The American occupation also shaped the decision as to how the revolution would occur. With half a million Allied soldiers stationed in the main islands, a violent revolution like had taken place in mainland China would be almost impossible. Another crucial factor was Japan's unique status. While it was a highly developed capitalist state, there were several feudal remnants still in effect and consequently the first task was to complete the bourgeois democratic revolution and then proceed to socialism. To do so, they had to first achieve a series of smaller tasks. A major goal was the abolition of the emperor system, followed by land reforms, improving working conditions, and the granting of full civil liberties to everyone. Finally, the party leaders, and especially Nosaka, opted for the policy of the peaceful revolution, which meant that instead of launching a violent revolution like Mao or Lenin had done in the past, they would vie for control of the country through democratic and legal avenues, although they also made sure to emphasize that this wasn't mere parliamentarianism. For sure, they would contest for political offices, but they would also rally the people in organizations to educate and lead them. A crucial aspect for the success of this peaceful revolution was the unification of workers, peasants, and the bourgeoisie under the leadership of the JCP and although the party started off with a great deal of momentum, it later suffered serious setbacks caused from both the American command as well as the JCP allies in Moscow and Beijing, who viewed this non-violent approach rather unfavorably, but more on that in a minute. Parallel to the discussions about the general strategy and future plans in case of a successful takeover, ran a struggle to win people's hearts and, more importantly, votes. Nosaka stated many times that mass support was the key to success or failure for this lovable communist party as it came to be known. The party, enjoying its legal status, didn't miss the opportunity to operate branch offices throughout the country and invited the public to freely participate in its work. Communists and their sympathizers rallied people and gave speeches about the party's program and asked their crowds for assistance in building a new Japan. In the parliamentary arena, the party's politicians systematically accused the conservative cabinets of fascism, 
protecting war criminals, and selling out the country to foreign powers. So who were the JCP's supporters? Well, like any Communist Party, there was one demographic group that was seen to be vital to its operations, and that was the working class. According to their beliefs, workers were more suited to leading a communist revolution because of their more developed spirit of camaraderie, unlike, say, farmers, who, although more numerous, tended to work alone, and therefore failed to understand collective efforts. So the successful mobilization of workers was a prerequisite in their effort to bring down the government and establish a socialist state. This potential power could only be harnessed through unionization of labor. Unions had been banned between 1940 and 1945, but luckily for the JCP, and thanks to reforms introduced by ESCAP in the fall of 1945, Japanese labor was now free from those restrictions and made quick steps towards unionization. The Japanese workers joined in the rapidly sprawling labor unions by the millions, even if they didn't fully understand the purpose of such functions. Two years later, there would be over 28,000 unions with more than 6 million members. Pre-war union leaders returned either from prison or from hideouts to their posts to organize and lead the workers, the vast majority of them favoring Marxist positions. As in pre-war times, they mainly belonged to two factions, the socialists and the communists. With union leadership sharing similar political views, and with the extremely effective work of communist factions within the labor unions, the Communist Party was immensely successful in mobilizing labor for political purposes. These mobilizations usually took the form of strikes aimed to paralyze the country, but they also included a new and more interesting type of strike called production control. Instead of abandoning the factory and refusing to work, the workers would kick out managers, executives, and owners, and operate the factory on their own until their demands were met. In that way, the workers could gain confidence in their abilities to produce goods without the help of the capitalists and get to experience a miniature model of the proletariat economy the party was promising. Worker strikes became JCP's chief weapon, and in the summer of 1946, those strikes grew to major proportions when the government proposed the dismissal of 130,000 railway workers. As the months passed, the movement gained more and more momentum, so much so that on October 13th, Akahata proclaimed, The capitalist camp directed by the Yoshida cabinet, frightened by the intensification of the labor offensive, already has begun to weaken. By January of 1947, more than 3 million organized workers, whether communists, socialists, or neutrals, had joined in the snowballing movement determined to bring down the Yoshida government. The decisive battle, as the Communist Party called it, the general strike that would paralyze the entire country and would overthrow the government, was planned for February 1st. Last-minute concessions by the Japanese government failed to impress the strike leaders. The stage was set for a peaceful communist takeover to take place. Only, well, it didn't. On the eve of the planned general strike, mere hours before it was to begin, MacArthur stepped in. He directly ordered the leaders of the movement to step back, threatening them that he wouldn't permit the use of a deadly social weapon. Facing no other option, the head of the committee was forced to call off the strike through a nationwide radio broadcast. The cancelled strike, which marked the high point of communist influence in the labor movement, resulted in a serious backlash for the JCP as the disappointed people decided to punish the party, and in the following general elections, it received only five seats, whereas the Socialist Party pulled seven times as many votes as the Communists and advanced to the leading position on the left. Furthermore, in fear of another SCAP intervention, Communist labor leaders were forced to abandon large-scale strikes and instead stage temporal work stoppages and regional strikes. Now, despite its inability to seize and retain control of the Japanese labor movement, the lovable Communist Party wasn't out of the picture. Well, not yet, anyway. They had penetrated student intellectual circles, and through the National Federation of Student Self-Government Associations, or Zengakuren, they exercised complete control of the student movement. At the same time, they were popular among the Korean minority in Japan, which numbered around half a million people. Through the following years, they managed to slowly build back some of their strength 
and in the general elections of 1949, they made unprecedented gains by winning 10% of the popular vote and securing 35 seats. However, this success was an aberration. Despite its gains, the party remained largely separated from the masses, unable to gain much support from urban workers or rural peasants. The tactic of peaceful revolution, despite probably being the best course of action, just wasn't as successful as the Communist Party leaders had hoped it would be. The results of the election were maybe less than Tokuda and Nosaka expected, and the overall progress had angered Stalin and Mao. But, and there's always a but, there were those who felt threatened by even the meager 10%. The rising tensions between the two superpowers and the shift in US policy towards the economic reconstruction and remilitarization of Japan meant that the communists, who held some vital positions in the country, were now undesirable and had to be rooted out. With American aid, the Japanese government in the fall of 1949 carried out a sweeping red purge, firing thousands of communists from government posts, teaching positions, and even private corporations. As if that wasn't enough, in January of 1950, the common form reprimanded the JCP's peaceful policy. Stalin was tired of waiting for a bloodless takeover of Japan, and was now more or less ordering the Japanese to carry out a violent revolution along Mao's lines. This attack was devastating for the JCP, as rival factions within the party began fighting for supremacy, with ultimately the militant 1951 platform prevailing. Their call for an armed uprising led to a campaign of terror, with activists throwing Molotov cocktails at police stations, assaulting law enforcement officers, and sabotaging factories, while provocateurs were sent into the mountains to organize farmers into a guerrilla army. But like I said earlier in the video, there was good reason the party had opted for a peaceful approach. The backlash from the Japanese government and the US authorities was immediate, with the militants being rounded up, tried, and sentenced to lengthy prison terms. In addition, the general public was horrified by the violent tactics of the JCP and decided to punish the party in the upcoming elections in 1952, where the communists failed to elect even a single representative. It would take two decades for the party to recover from this devastating blow. With the militant approach proving to be way worse than Nosaka's lovable communism, the party gradually returned to its previous line. At the Sixth Party Congress in 1955, the JCP finally renounced the militant line completely and returned to the policy of peaceful revolution. The Red Purge and the militant backlash delivered heavy blows to the Japanese Communist Party, but were not able to kill it completely. As time passed, it was able to recover lost ground, and it would play a central role during the massive Anpo protests in 1960. Through the following decades, it would have its ups and downs, and today is one of the largest non-ruling communist parties in the world. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode, and to make sure you don't miss all of our future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have languished in prison for 20 years, only to then be released so you can press the bell button, but before you can do that, Moscow and Beijing order you to violently overthrow the internet, which will just land you back in prison before you can press the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com, and we're active on Facebook and Instagram at the Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, your financial support would be greatly appreciated via www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar or through YouTube membership. This is the Cold War Channel, and don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated.